in my opinion, one of the most important skills in life and one of the most important lessons you'll learn is the ability to detect when someone is completely BSing you. How to tell if someone is completely full of it. I mean, when you think about it, that skill is just the ability to tell when someone is lying to you. So imagine how much better your life would be if every time somebody lied to you, you could instantly recognize it was a lie and then move on from there. I don't think anyone would really debate that that would be a nice skill to have. History is absolutely replete with examples of this idea. Typically, it manifests itself as when there's a real crisis, there needs to be measures, sometimes drastic measures need to be taken in order to overcome the crisis. But how do you tell if something is a real crisis versus something that is a lesser issue, but maybe a politician or someone in power is attempting to use that crisis to kind of BS you and gain power for themselves. There seems to be a very thin line between people being honest about an actual crisis and how you need to combat it versus politicians and people in power exploiting that crisis in order to get what they want. And a lot of times it's actually very difficult to tell when something is a real crisis and it's even more difficult to tell when someone is exploiting that crisis for their own benefit. So a lot of times when politicians and people in power exploit that crisis, it's because there is a real fear that something bad is happening. And a lot of times that real fear is actually based on something that is real than happening around them. To bring this back to Hitler and the Nazis, many of the people in Germany feared a communist uprising around the early 1930s. And Hitler and the Nazi party used this as kind of their crisis, which they could use to manipulate the population. There was a recent and bloody communist revolution in Russia just a decade or so ago. Communist election results were improving in the early 1930s parliamentary elections, and it seemed to the Nazis like this could be a great example of something where we can use this fear to exploit people and kind of gather power around us. So while the Nazis tried to spread that fear of the communist revolution that could possibly happen in Germany, they still needed that one spark, that one big event where they could point to the communists and then basically use that crisis that the communists are involved in and use that as a justification for committing violence and eliminating the Communist Party altogether and actually furthermore consolidating and creating a totalitarian regime. That spark, that one crisis event that would allow the Nazis to unleash their totalitarian regime was known as the Reichstag fire. In the early morning hours of February 27th, 1933, a man by the name of Marinus Vanderlub decided to put his radical and intense ideology into practice. So Marinus was a communist sympathizer who thought that the government of Germany was oppressing the working class and any symbol of government power or any sort of monument to the state needed to be eliminated. So Marinus Again, saw his opportunity. He went out to the store, bought some matches, bought some fire lighters, and he goes into the Reichstag. He figures out a way to get inside. He enters the main chamber. He tries to light some stuff on fire. It doesn't work. Eventually, he moves his way to the drapes around the windows, and he's successfully able to light those on fire. The drapes would erupt in huge flames that would overtake the entire main chamber, and most of the building would go up in flames and would be completely destroyed. Of course, by this point, the fire department and the police are all there trying to put out the fire, and our friend Marinus is caught by the authorities. 
And now they have to decide who is this guy, why did he do this, and what do we do with him? Marinus was caught with communist leaflets that he carried with him in the pocket of his pants. And this is obviously not a good sign for any sort of communist political movement that you have somebody out there proclaiming to be a communist and, you know, burning stuff down, potentially harming people, uh, inflicting pain and suffering, inflicting destruction on the main symbol of the Weimar Republic, the Reichstag. But listen to Rudolf Diels. He's the basically the police chief, and he's interviewing this Marinus guy, and he's trying to figure out why he did this. Quote, The frank confessions of Marinus van der Lubbe could in no way lead me to think that such a little fire raiser, who knew his crazy business so well, needed helpers. Why shouldn't just a single match suffice to light to the cold, flammable pomp of the plenary chamber, the old upholstered furniture and heavy curtains, and the bone-dry wooden splendor of the paneling? but this specialist employed a whole rucksack full of incendiary devices, end quote. Okay, so what he's saying there is that this was just one guy. He had some matches. He had some fire lighters. He had a whole, you know, backpack full of stuff, you know, that would light stuff on fire. And it was just one guy. And that's kind of the end of the story. And we do know based on all the evidence we have in the modern day that this guy was indeed working alone. The communists who, you know, are sitting in their political offices, you know, planning for the next election, they had no idea this guy was going out and doing the things he was doing. But just as the police chief is coming to that conclusion that it was just one man, kind of a lone wolf operation, Adolf Hitler and his cronies have arrived on the scene, and they are completely hysterical about what is going on here. They see the fire, and they are claiming that this is some sort of beginning of a you know, countrywide communist uprising and we need to prepare everybody for war and Hitler is really taking this to the next level. So listen to the police chief talking about what Hitler sounded like in the aftermath of the Reichstag fire. Quote, he shouted as if he wanted to burst in an unrestrained way such as I had not previously experienced with them. There will be no more mercy now. Anyone who stands in our way will be butchered. The German people won't have any understanding for leniency. Every communist functionary will be shot where he is found. The communist deputies must be hanged this very night. Everybody in league with the communists is to be arrested. Against Social Democrats and Reichsbanner too, there will be no mercy. End quote. So Hitler is making it abundantly clear what his plan is after this Reichstag fire. He's basically going to say, the heck with the Constitution... We're going to go door to door. We're going to start pulling out communists. We're going to start pulling out social democrats. Anyone who's not on board with my Nazi government is going to be removed from their homes and eliminated. Whatever it takes to do that. Whether that's shooting them, throwing them in jail, intimidating them, intimidating their families, removing them from power in the parliament. We're going to do whatever it takes. Hitler would say, quote, we can't be dependent on judicial considerations, end quote, when trying to fight against people who don't agree with the Nazi regime. So Hitler could care less about law, order, the government, the Constitution, Parliament. At this point, and from this point forward, this was going to be the Nazis' show to run in Germany. Hitler had found his crisis and he had exploited the real fear of the population and now he could go ahead and implement his plan. So the first order of business is to essentially suspend the Weimar Constitution. Here's paragraph one of the document that ends up going into law. Quote, Thus restrictions on personal liberty on the right of free expression of opinion, including freedom of the press, on the right of assembly and association, and violations of the privacy of postal, telegraphic, and telephonic communications, and warrants for house searches, orders for confiscation, as well as restrictions on property rights are now permissible beyond the legal limits otherwise prescribed. End quote. So what that fancy paragraph of legal jargon says is that freedom of speech, freedom of press, freedom of religion... All that stuff is now off the table. Welcome to the Nazi dictatorship. While Hitler and the Nazi party was shoring up the legal justification for everything, 
They were also unleashing their brown shirts and their paramilitaries to go out and wreak havoc in what was an absolutely bloodthirsty and ferocious retaliation for this Reichstag fire. Nazi paramilitaries would go into neighborhoods, schools, political buildings, you name it, and they would pull out anybody who was even suspected of sympathizing with communists, and they would pull them out, beat them up, intimidate them. I mean, they would roam the streets and just beat people up that looked at them wrong. I mean, the level of violence was really unprecedented. Listen to historian Richard J. Evans talking about this, quote, All over the country, Communist Party organizations were smashed, offices occupied, activists taken into custody. Often the stormtroopers carried off any funds they could lay their hands on and looted the homes of Communist Party members for cash and valuables while the police looked on. Soon the wave of arrests swelled to many times the number originally envisioned. End quote. What he's basically saying there is that this is an old school violence, looting, pillaging operation, and it really did get bloodthirsty. You might be asking to yourself, where are the police in all this, or even where's the army during all of this? So, in a very clever move, one of the first things that Hitler did when he became the chancellor was to get in good with the army. So his first order of business was to bring the army essentially under his control. Now many people in the top levels of the military already supported Hitler, but any who didn't, Hitler used kind of political maneuverings and different techniques to isolate those officers and kind of prevent them from having much influence. Hitler would go on to manipulate a guy by the name of Blomberg. He was the chief of the general staff, one of the highest officers in the army and he would entice these these guys these high level guys that promises to end the treaty of versailles expand the army initiate conscription maybe even hinting of you know remilitarizing and this is all stuff that the army probably likes because they want to kind of expand their role so political maneuverings basically put the political and military decisions in the hands of Hitler. So eventually he would basically make it the law that everything in the military ran through him. You can combine this with the fact that Goring and Hitler already controlled the ministers and the ministries of the interior, and this essentially means they control the police force. So now all of a sudden Hitler has the police, he has the army, he has the paramilitaries, the brown shirts, you know, the steel helmets and they're going out and they are really creating violence all across Germany without any penalties or I should say without any significant penalties and it all makes sense from a rational perspective I mean if you want to go out and create a dictatorship probably the first order of business is go out control the the weapons control the army control the police control the paramilitaries control that aspect of violence and now all of a sudden you can kind of force people to do what you want How many dictatorships throughout history have been kind of military coups or military dictatorships, at least to start? But even Hitler realized that this couldn't all be seen as kind of like a violent takeover. He needed to have a political and social aspect to this Nazi revolution that would allow him to have legitimacy in the eyes of the people who are, you know, the people of Germany. So now that Hitler controlled kind of the military aspect of it and the police aspect of it, He really needed to crack down on the other political parties. So first order of business was control the army and the police. Next order of business is get every other political entity under the control of the Nazis and do it in a way that at least has the thin veneer of legitimacy. Hitler and the Nazis would very much do this in a methodical kind of one by one approach. And the first victim, of course, was the Communist Party. After the Reichstag fire, Hitler actually didn't outlaw the party completely, which might seem like a surprising move. Instead, he treated every individual communist like a criminal. So he didn't want to have the other political parties fear like they were being outlawed or kind of have this fear of maybe the Nazis are not allowing a democratic election to happen because the 1933 election is going to be coming up soon. So if he had just outlawed the Communist Party, then that might have delegitimized the kind of legitimacy of the election. 
And there was also a political move behind this as well, because Hitler's now allowing the communists to run, so he knows that they're going to collect maybe 70, 80, 90 Reichstag seats. And once they're sitting in parliament, he can just go out and arrest them. So those votes, essentially those people in parliament, don't matter. But if he had outlawed the party, then all of a sudden all of those people who would have voted for the communists would probably vote for the Social Democrats instead of the Nazi party. So by allowing the communists to run in the election, he's actually improving the Nazi party's political chances of not giving up any more seats to the Social Democrats. So it was a smart move politically, and it essentially neutralizes the Communist Party, who is now associated with the Reichstag fire, and basically any communist is a treasonous criminal in Nazi Germany at this point. Hitler and Goring had already openly stated that the next election in 1933 was going to be the last democratic election in Germany, and that this was going to be kind of the seal of legitimacy that the Nazi party was going to use to rule Germany and create the Third Reich. But most people would already agree that the Third Reich was probably already, if not already established, at least completely on the track to being established. I mean, listen to, again, our police chief Rudolf Diels reporting what what it was like on the streets. Quote, The storm squads cleaned up the districts. They knew not only where their enemies lived, they had also long ago discovered their hideouts and meeting places. Not only the communists, but anybody who had ever spoken out against Hitler's movement was in danger. End quote. So the Nazis at this point basically ruled the streets. I mean, anyone who spoke out against them could be beaten up, threatened, uh, intimidated, etc. Nazi brown shirts would go out, steal pickup trucks from Jews, social democrats, communists, And they would basically ride around the streets of these cities with huge Nazi flags, brandishing weapons, firing off guns in the air. And, I mean, does this remind anyone of anything recently in current events? I mean, to me, this perfectly fits the description of when I watch a newscast of what ISIS does. Really interesting to make the parallels there. Ultimately, the time would come for that election of 1933, the last democratic election. Again, you have the SA, the brown shirts, parading around the streets, intimidating voters. You have Nazi propaganda absolutely everywhere. Posters, flags, pamphlets, people. And there's no opposition propaganda anywhere. The media, the newspapers are largely under control. Okay, so anyone who wrote a story about, you know, poor little Johnny got beat up on the way to school today because he said he was a social democrat. Anyone who runs a story like that is going to be shut down. So the Nazis shut down newspaper after newspaper after newspaper. And they actually had their own newspapers, uh, you know, promoting stories like instead of Little Johnny gets beat up by the Nazis, it would be, you know, Little Johnny threatened to kill somebody and then somebody put him in his place and it was all, you know, appropriate behavior. So the Nazi propaganda machine was fully in motion here. And I mean, clearly this was not a true democratic election. I mean, with that level of violence, with that level of propaganda, and with that level of control, this is not a democratic election. And the Nazis still didn't get a majority of the vote. So they got 43.9% of the vote in this election, which is still not a majority, even under what is essentially a dictatorship at this point. If you add in the nationalist vote to the Nazi vote, they still don't have close to a two-thirds majority in parliament, which they would need to amend the Weimar Constitution. I think this is really important to establish here that the Nazis were not supported by the majority of the population in Germany. So they got 43.9% of the vote, and that's only of the people who voted. So the actual numbers of, you know, percentages of the people who actually supported the Nazis, much lower than that. And again, that's 43.9% of a vote that is under a dictatorship condition with propaganda and violence and intimidation, etc. However, what this vote does show is that two-thirds of the overall vote did go to either the Nazis, the Nationalists, or the Communists. And all three of those parties are anti-democracy. So at this point, the majority of people are voting to basically end the Weimar Republic. 
1933, the Weimar Republic is dead. Soon after the election, most of the communist politicians would just be arrested. Anyone who got voted into parliament uh, would either be beaten, killed, arrested. Uh, the communist headquarters were essentially ransacked, invaded. Any sort of local communist offices were destroyed. More or less, this was the end of the Communist Party. Now the Nazis had to turn to the Social Democrat Party and eliminate that. They filled in all sorts of key government positions, police positions with Nazis. Any Social Democratic officials in the government were banned, arrested, or forced to flee. And again, much of the reasoning here was to restore public order from all this chaos that's going on. So the Nazis were... You know, the party that was going to restore order to Germany. And ironically, they're the ones themselves that are creating that chaos with all the violence and the chaos in the streets. Just listen to what happened to a Social Democratic Reichstag deputy and a leading party figure for the Social Democrats who had to deal with this. Quote, he was attacked by brown shirts and SS men in his home, beaten up, taken off to the local Nazi party headquarters, tortured for two hours and made to drink castor oil and urine before the police arrived and took him to a prison hospital to patch up his wounds, end quote. So that story from Richard J. Evans just kind of shows the really lawlessness at this point in that anyone who was not aligned politically with the Nazis could at any point be pulled out of their homes, tortured, and either killed, murdered, or sent to the hospital. It is at this point that Heinrich Himmler opens up the first concentration camp in Germany at Dachau. Mainly it was for political prisoners, and it set the precedent for all sorts of concentration camps to pop up. Again, Jewish people, communists, social democrats, political enemies, all these people were taken to these concentration camps, tortured, and sometimes you know, neglected enough to be killed or even murdered on the spot. The Nazi press, of course, the newspapers would spin this as normal, and again, we're restoring order to all the chaos that's going on. And it's important to note that this was all part of the plan since 1923, okay, when the Nazis came up with their constitution. And just let me quote from the Nazi constitution here, quote, Immediately arrest and condemn all communist and social democratic functionaries and quarter all suspects and spiritual instigators in concentration camps, end quote. It really is crazy to think that this was not some sort of surprise that was foisted on people. This was all part of the plan, and this was part of the plan that the Nazis put out in public, and either they weren't believed or they weren't taken seriously, or even more sadly, People just didn't care. These early concentration camps would be absolutely horrifying. They would imprison political prisoners that included men and women. There was absolutely no mercy here. Listen to one of the accounts. Again, this comes from Richard J. Evans, quote, The communist worker Friedrich Schlatterbeck, arrested in 1933, reported later how he was interrogated at police headquarters by a group of SS men. They punched him in the face, beat him with rubber truncheons, tied him up, hit him over the head with a wooden bar, kicked him when he fell to the floor, and threw water over him when he lost consciousness. A police officer fired questions at him in the quieter moments and intervened only when one of the SS men, enraged at his vigorous physical resistance, pulled a revolver and threatened to shoot the prisoner. Having failed to confess, he was taken back to his cell, sore, covered in cuts and bruises, blood streaming down his face, and barely able to walk. Schlotterbeck was treated kindly by the warders, who nonetheless had to inform him that they had to keep the light on in his cell and check on him regularly in case he tried to kill himself. He was to spend the next decade and more in penitentiaries and concentration camps. His experience was not untypical of that of the committed communists who refused to give in. End quote. At least 100,000 political arrests were made in 1933 alone. That's an absolutely crazy number, and you wonder how many of those 100,000-plus people experienced conditions like I just described. Ultimately, the Reichstag fire decree 
and the elections of 1933 would give Hitler kind of a seal of legal and political legitimacy to do whatever he wanted. But he still realized that technically the Reichstag and technically President Hindenburg are still there. Remember, President Hindenburg, he's kind of that guy who won't go away, but technically he still has power nominally to do some things. Technically the Reichstag still has the ability to vote on things. And Hitler realizes he needs to get rid of this immediately. So he comes up with what's called the Enabling Act. And this basically means that Hitler himself can make and pass any law without Reichstag approval or President Hindenburg's approval. The Enabling Act essentially, effectively, would be the end of democracy and it would be a legal seal of legitimacy on that end of democracy. Hitler would introduce this Enabling Act in his speech after the parliamentary elections, which was kind of a traditional thing to have a you know, speech by the majority and the minority parties. And he would say, quote, May you gentlemen now take the decision yourselves as to whether it to be peace or war. End quote. So Hitler's basically outlining right there, if you guys don't ratify this vote, it's going to be war between the Nazis and you guys. And unless you want a civil war, you better vote in this enabling act. And at this point, with Hitler having the army and the police and the brown shirts and the SA on his side, it's tough not to take him seriously there. I mean, just the speech itself and just the atmosphere surrounding any speech that Hitler gave was kind of this example of propaganda and totalitarian kind of tactics. I mean, you would have tens of thousands of people marching with banners and songs and flags. You would have all sorts of propaganda posters, flags hanging around where Hitler was speaking. And Hitler had that way of talking where he could influence people. One person called it intoxication without wine. The kind of atmosphere of Germany at this point could be compared with the enthusiasm for war before World War I in 1914. Listen to a young girl who attended one of these speeches that Hitler gave and talks about basically her feelings on it. Quote, the horror it inspired to in me was almost imperceptibly spiced with an intoxicated joy. We want to die for the flag, the torchbearers had sung. I was overcome with a burning desire to belong to these people for whom it was a matter of life and death. I wanted to escape from my childish, narrow life, and I wanted to attach myself to something that was great and fundamental. End quote. Listening to stuff like this reminds you a little bit of maybe like the Cultural Revolution in China where... Young people were definitely influenced and kind of made to believe sorts of propaganda, and it was all based on the emotions and the feelings of what these young people were actually going through. It seems like there was definitely some sort of intoxicating kind of emotional appeal that made Nazi Germany and its ideals of greatness and power to be enticing. Hitler's speeches, as we talked about in previous episodes, were always filled with vague emotional appeals. There was rarely anything concrete or specific as far as specific plans to make things better. He just appealed to kind of that nationalism and that elimination of the traitors and the communists and the you know people who screwed everything up during World War I and afterwards. Anyway, back to the Enabling Act. So... Hitler gives his speech kind of introducing the law and demanding that everybody kind of, you know, go along with it or they're going to be eliminated. And the tradition is that the opposition also gets a chance to give a speech. So the Social Democratic uh, Party, a guy by the name of Otto Wells, gets up there and he's going to be the one who delivers this opposition speech. And Otto Wells is actually carrying a cyanide capsule in his pocket in the likely event that, you know, the brown shirts and the Nazis just get up there, carry him off, and torture and kill him. So the fact that, you know, Germany was now a violent dictatorship is just ratified right here where you have this guy giving a political speech, but he can't even do that without protecting himself with that cyanide capsule. Wells gets up to the podium. He's clearly choking with emotion fighting back tears, 
but he's appealing to a possible future. He says, quote, In this historic hour, we German Social Democrats solemnly profess our allegiance to the basic principles of humanity and justice, freedom, and socialism. No enabling law gives you the right to annihilate ideas that are eternal and indestructible. The anti-socialist law did not annihilate the Social Democrats. Social democracy can also draw new strength from fresh persecutions. We greet the persecuted and the hard-pressed. Their steadfastness and loyalty deserve admiration. The courage of their convictions, their unbroken confidence, vouch for a brighter future. End quote. So whether or not you agree with the you know, politics of the Social Democratic Party, that guy's up there making a speech for humanity, compassion, justice, you know, a return to the values that are inherent in each person. This plea for compassion and humility would be met by laughter from the Nazis. So the entire chamber was just an uproar of laughter. The Nazis knew they didn't need the Social Democrats to pass any of these laws. They could do the same things to them that they did to the Communist Party. And to me, there's definitely something sad about this. Kind of the last dying ember of compassion and reason isn't met with anger and violence, but laughter at this point. There's something even more sad about that. So the Nazis would basically use that threat of civil war to get the Enabling Act passed. And after this, you know, act went through, their next order of business, of course, is to eliminate the Social Democratic Party. The Nazis just completely banned the party. There were no meetings to be allowed. No seats in the Reichstag could be occupied. No publications or newspapers could be controlled by anyone who was associated with the Social Democratic Party. Thousands of people were arrested, tortured, beaten. Hundreds of people were killed. There's a story of a newspaper editor who was shot, and the Nazi press basically covers it up. Stuff like this would happen all the time. Trade unions got similar treatment. There was a little less violence there, but kind of this idea of intimidation, propaganda brought in a lot of them to the Nazi side. And just like that, the main party of the Weimar Republic was gone. If you're keeping track at home, the Nazis now control the army, the police, the paramilitaries, the press. They've gotten rid of the Communist Party. They've eliminated the Social Democratic Party. The next big opposition would be what was known as the Center Party. So the Center Party in Germany was kind of a conservative party and they were backed mainly by Catholics. Hitler and the Nazis realized that this kind of strategy of using violence and beatings and intimidation to just wipe out the center party is not going to look good because, again, you're messing here with religion, you're messing with a party that actually shares some of your ideals, especially when it regards communism. Uh, The center party did not like communism at all. The Catholic Church was very scared of any sort of atheist, communist uh, uprising happening. So Hitler realized he couldn't use the same tactics that he did with the communists to get rid of the center party. Hitler would turn more towards negotiation. He would get the bishops of Catholic Germany to essentially agree to a deal that allows the Catholic participation in the state, uh, nominally at least, and they would issue a decree of support for the Nazis Any priests who criticized the Nazi movement were punished. Catholic newspapers began to essentially be Nazi supporter propaganda. And ultimately the center party would just dissolve itself and be absorbed by the Nazi party. So that takes care of the center party. There's definitely a good bit of controversy regarding how much the Catholic Church in Germany kind of allowed the Nazi operation to continue going and even kind of just allow themselves to be kind of absorbed into that new German spirit um, because it seems like they wanted uh, to infuse Christianity and Catholicism into that new German spirit. So the best way to do that might just be to kind of get absorbed by the Nazi party, kind of go along with what they were doing. Again, there were priests and, you know, different Catholic uh, officials who did disagree with the Nazis and did not kind of go along with the 
general kind of uneasy alliance with the Nazi party. But I think it would be fair to be critical of the Catholic Church in this particular moment and their inability to step up for what was right. And I think the Catholic Church and the Center Party would probably agree with that in hindsight because, you know, the Nazi Party would eventually turn on them just like they turned on everybody else who kind of gets absorbed into the Nazi Party. And really pretty much anyone, everyone in this story is going to be regretful that the Nazis would come to power. But that's a tale for another day. The last major party the Nazis would have to deal with was the Nationalist Party. Again, these guys were probably the closest friends of the Nazis, and um, they applied political, police, paramilitary pressure, um, even violence in certain cases, uh, which is strange considering that Nationalists were the Nazis' closest friends. Ultimately, they came up with what was known as the Friendship Agreement. So the Nationalists would dissolve themselves, just like the Center Party, into the Nazi Party, and kind of the steel helmets, the paramilitary groups that were part of the Nationalists would get absorbed into the Nazi SA, absorbed into the brown shirts, and really that's it. So the communists, the social democrats, the center party, the nationalists are no longer a factor by the end of 1933. Hitler now has control of the military and the weapons, the police, all that stuff. He now has control of all the political parties, but the last thing he needs is control of the social realm. He wants to control the culture, because not only is this a political movement, it's supposed to also be a cultural movement, where Germany's kind of status as the supreme culture in the world is restored. This idea would come to be known as Gleicheltung, which means coordination. The Nazis were very much trying to bring together social life with political life. They wanted people to behave like proper Nazis in their social realm as well as the political realm. In order to do this, Hitler would create the Reich Ministry for Popular Enlightenment and Propaganda, headed by Joseph Goebbels. So this idea was to make a spiritual mobilization of the population of Germany. Basically, society had to be changed to fit Nazi ideology. For example... Radio, cinema, music, theater, all areas that the Nazis tried to infiltrate, and they would use the same system of violence and bullying in order to get what they wanted and basically stop people from listening to anything that might criticize the Nazi ideology, criticize anything they saw as racially impure, anything like that. They needed to get rid of it. A great example of this is jazz music. So... During the Weimar, you know, the Roaring Twenties, a lot of jazz clubs popped up in Germany. They were somewhat popular on the streets of big cities and stuff. So the Nazis would actually send in spies into jazz clubs, and anytime somebody played jazz, they would report those people who could then be, you know, arrested, intimidated, beat up, prevented from doing their job, prevented from making a living, etc. The Nazis hated jazz because it was seen as coming from you know, black African-American culture, and because of the Nazis' racial ideology, they saw blacks as lesser beings than, you know, the German kind of ideal Aryan race. There's all sorts of cool stories about how bouncers would identify when Nazi spies would come into a club and they would ring a secret bell or have some sort of secret signal, and this would signal the musicians on the stage to immediately start playing something else. So they would, you know, be up there playing jazz and rocking out. And then when the Nazi spies would come in, they'd get the signal and they'd change the time signature or they'd change some of the, you know, the tones, the keys, and all of a sudden it wouldn't sound like jazz anymore. Sadly, though, many people saw the writing on the wall and thousands and thousands of talented people would either leave Germany or be subjected to much worse. So... There was a huge exodus of talented musicians, uh, actors, writers, artists, anyone like this often left Nazi Germany at this point because they realized what was happening. There was a famous book burning on May 10th of 1933, which was coordinated by a Nazi youth group. Thousands of books were stacked in huge piles and burned, and the assault against reason and different ideas would continue. 
there was actually a separate pile altogether for the book All Quiet on the Western Front. The Nazis hated this depiction of World War I. If you haven't read All Quiet, it's basically kind of a somber reflection on the unnecessary nature of war and how both sides are subjected to violence and suffering that feels unnecessary and unjustified. And of course, this is rapidly against the Nazi depiction of war, which is something that is probably necessary in order to bring the rest of Europe into line and bring Germany back onto the top of European affairs. I forget who said it, but I was reading about this book burning, and somebody said, where books are burned, in the end, people will be burned too. It's hard to find any errors in that statement. The assault on culture, cinema, music, theater, radio, books, essays, education as well was another big factor that the Nazis tried to infiltrate. All of this was backed up, of course, by the elimination of Jews and the Nazi belief that Jews should be eliminated from Nazi culture. So this happened by violence, intimidation, beating up Jews, boycotts of Jewish stores would be uh, something that happened in Nazi Germany and something that the Nazi government would order. Thousands, really tens of thousands, saw the writing on the wall and they emigrated while they could. They got the heck out of Germany while they could. But for many, they either rationalized the threat of the Nazis away, thinking that things couldn't be this bad forever, they would get better. And many actually, you know, like the elderly or people who would have difficulty finding a job overseas, uh, decided to stay in their home country and hope things would get better. Unfortunately, they wouldn't. By the end of 1933, we now have the full transition from democracy to dictatorship. Hitler and the Nazis had swiftly moved to take control of the army, the police, the military, the press, the political parties, the culture, even who was allowed to be inside of Germany and who wasn't. Germany at this point was arguably Europe's most powerful, advanced, and populated country at the time, and the rest of Europe, and really the rest of the world, was about to figure out what would happen if a totalitarian dictatorship takes over the most populated and advanced country in Europe. To go back to our question at the beginning of the episode, how do you tell if you're being exploited? How do you tell if you're politicians or maybe someone in an authority position is lying to you. The higher the stakes get, the higher the importance of this question becomes and the importance of being able to differentiate when a crisis is real versus when a crisis is being exploited becomes super important. And I hope that there was something in this episode that made you think about this question and hopefully will help you make that distinction if the time comes. Okay, so that's going to do it for my series on the rise of the Nazis. I kind of laid out all my thoughts on what are some of the most important factors that lead to a totalitarian dictatorship and really just a horrible place to live in a society. I'll let you make your own parallels between what we saw in Nazi Germany versus kind of what we see in the modern day, if there's any parallels to be made at all. So if you have something to say on that, send me an email, tweet me. Otherwise, as always, you can rate, review, subscribe, write an iTunes review, tell a friend, etc. Thank you for listening and being a supporter of the podcast in those ways. I will see you next time. And in the immortal words of George Costanza, that's it for me.